in Africa this morning and uh, they had some mountain deer that's what they look like to me I think they called them an ibex an I-B-E-X and the narrator as they're watching these ibex they they have their young way up in the mountains, uh, rocky, jagged mountains, and uh, for safety purposes. And then the mother leads the babies as they've gotten older. She leads them down these jagged mountains. And the narrator said that they have a, a very unique footing they they have unique feet that are just so perfectly designed to be able to maneuver those mountain fastness and as i listened to them and as they showed the ibex feet reminded me of a passage in habakkuk chapter 3 Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. The Bible says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. The fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. And then verse 19 says, The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. To the chief singer on my stringed instruments. So God has promised those rocky crevices, those difficult mountain passes that appear insurmountable, that appear impossible to maneuver, God has said He will give us the ability, He will give us feet like Heinz feet. He will make us to walk upon our high places. I was amazed watching the ibex. Folk, that mountain fastness was almost a pure face. Almost a pure face down, 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 several hundred feet. And how those ibex were able to maneuver its because of their incredible footing that the Creator has made for them to be able to maneuver that. And it reminded me of this beautiful passage in Habakkuk chapter 3. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon my high places. Well, let's go ahead and kneel for prayer for those who can. Father in heaven, we're grateful today for your promises. We're grateful today that they provide every need that we have as people. Whether it's forgiveness, whether it's power, strength, peace, comfort, companionship, we're thankful that they provide all our needs in Christ Jesus. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us this morning. That we would be reminded again of your willingness to give us hinds feet. To help us walk and maneuver through this world of sin and pain. Bless us with the Holy Spirit today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, this morning we're going to finish our study of Dudley Canwright. As we've mentioned previously in our first two parts, Dudley Canwright in the 19th and early 20th centuries, of all the defectors from Seventh-day Adventism, none attacked Seventh-day Adventists so uh, unfortunately and so strongly as did Dudley Canwright. I think Dudley Canwright's counter in the late 20th and 21st, early part of the 21st century would be another man by the name of Desmond Ford. Uh, both of those men would attack Seventh Adventism uh, without very many equals. And the subtitle today is Stay with the Message, Jasper. Jasper was Dudley Canwright's youngest brother. And we will find out who said this later on in the message this morning. Stay with the message, Jasper. We've mentioned already a few times that there was a testimony after the stay that the Whites had in 1873 in the mountains of Colorado as James White was recovering from his first stroke. And the Whites invited the Canwrights and their young daughter, uh, Genevieve, to stay with them in this, this uh, cabin in Colorado. So they were there for quite a while together until things got so um, upset so caustic that finally the Canwrights left. Well, Ellen White, shortly thereafter in August of 1873, it's found in Testimonies, Volume 3, pages 304 to 329. And I would encourage everybody to go back and read those passages. Uh, it's a letter. And it was written to Dudley and Lucretia Canwright. Now I think I'm just going to read portions of this letter uh, that I think you will get an understanding as to what Ellen White was saying. She says, I was pointed back to your past life. I saw that from a child you have been self-confident headstrong and self-willed and have followed your own mind. You have an independent spirit and it has been very difficult for you to yield to anyone. Ellen Dent White then goes on and talks about primarily Dudley Canwright's rashness, his desire to be independent she said, your self-confidence increased. You were less humble and became more independent. She then talks about the fact that Dudley was opposed to Brother and Sister White. As you looked at the work of Brother and Sister White, you thought you could see where you could have done better than they. Feeling have been cherished in your heart against them. You were naturally skeptical, infidel in your feelings. As you have seen their work and heard the reproofs given to those who were wrong, you have questioned how you would bear such plain testimony. Ellen White loved people. And Ellen White desired to see people in God's kingdom. And she was not going to sugarcoat or make it somehow sweet when she had to confront issues. When she had to confront 
somebody who needed correction. So Ellen White was very direct and primarily, again, in this portion of the letter, she is talking specifically to Dudley Canwright. How utterly prophetic and insightful. Canwright's self-confidence and desire for self-exaltation was what ultimately took him down. He wanted to be the top dog and wanted people to so appreciate his abilities. He felt it was the Advent message that got in the way of him becoming famous. We noticed that last week and we'll touch on it momentarily again this morning. So, can write self-confidence and his desire to exalt himself ultimately brought him down. On pages 306 and 307 of volume 3, Ellen White writes, You decided you could not receive it, the council. Began to brace yourself against the manner of their laboring, James and Ellen White. And thus opened a door in your heart for suspicion, doubt, and jealousy of them and their work. I was shown that you are in danger of getting above the simplicity of the work and of placing yourself upon the pinnacle. You feel that you need no reproof and counsel. And the language of your heart is, I am capable of judging, discriminating, and determining between right and wrong. I will not have my rights infringed upon. No one shall dictate to me. I am capable of forming my own plans of action. I am as good as anybody. God is with me and gives me success in my efforts. Who has authority to interfere with me? You know, folk, I think the, the, the most scary part of this part of Ellen White's letter to Dudley, specifically to Dudley Canwright, is this right here. You feel you need no reproof and counsel. Well, nobody is above reproof. Nobody. No, none of us in this room are above reproof. And when we are reproved, and when we are being counseled, we need, we need by the grace of God to say, you are right. I am wrong. I made a mistake. Folk, we need to be able to admit wrong. We need to be able to do that. It's frightening. Frightening to see Dudley can write Basically saying, nobody can tell me anything. I know everything. That's scary. That is scary, folks. Brother A, Ellen White referred to Dudley Canwright. This is page 308 of Testimonies, volume 3. You have considered that your work was of too great importance for you to come down to engage in household duties. Now Ellen White goes from a general statement as to Dudley Canwright's feelings and attitude, and now she applies it in a very practical way. You felt that your work was too great to come down to engage in household duties. You have not a love for these requirements. You neglected them in your younger days, but these small duties which you neglect are essential to the formation of a well-developed character. 
I have been shown that our ministers generally are deficient in making themselves useful in the families where they are entertained. Some devote their minds to study because they love this employment. Wow. So, Ellen White not only rebuked Dudley Canwright, but Seventh-day Adventist ministers in general who think that they are doing the work of God when they are in study, but helping around the house, that has nothing to do with the work of God. Folk, based on what Ellen White says, the small duties of the home, the household duties, whether it be doing the dishes or vacuuming or taking out the garbage or washing clothes folk we would look at those and say well those are small duties but they're very important for keeping the home machinery working and no man no man none of us gentlemen should feel ever that we are above those important responsibilities, ever. Ellen White was very, very clear. It's the small duties, the small duties in the house that we think, oh, well, that's not important. I'm studying my Bible. No, there's a balance to be won out. Of course it's important to study your Bible. Of course it's important to pray. But folk, as Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. There's time for study and there's time to help with dishes. There's a time for prayer and there's a time to help with laundry or taking out the garbage or vacuuming anything that our spouse may deem necessary to help out with her needs. They should feel the deepest interest in the families they visit. They should not feel that they are to be petted and waited upon while they give nothing in return. Now, Ellen White, in this case, was talking about when ministers are staying in somebody else's home, when they're going out speaking. Ministers should not feel like the families where they visit are to wait upon them hand and foot, and that they are to be petted and pamby, you know, namby pambied and, and made to feel like they don't have to do anything. Ministers should help out in the homes, Ellen White said. So, folk, very practical, very practical, bringing religion down to the very nuts and bolts of, of very life. Doing dishes, vacuuming, not walking away and saying, I've got to go study. I've got more important things to do. No. You do the work that's right in front of you. And if these are in front of you and your wife is tired or wants to take a break or do something else, well then, gentlemen, get out the water off. Get out the soap and let's start doing some dishes. All the little duties that need to be done around the house are very important, Ellen White said in the development of character. A neglect of those duties versus a heart, hearty willingness to do them goes a long way in the development of character. You know, sometimes, folk, I know with me, Sometimes I'm, I'm, all, I'm thinking about, like, you know, meetings coming up. I've got like 10 or 12 meetings that I'm going to be having in other states. 
And so I'm thinking, well, you know, I've got to get those things done. And you do. I do. But there's also things right here in front of me right now that I have to do. And so I have to be balanced. Got to keep a balance. It's very important. Very important. Page 309 of Still, Volume 3 of the Testimonies. And folk remember as we continue on reading this, Dudley can write, he never got over this letter. He never got over this letter. Ellen White said to him, you neglect many of the little courtesies of life because you think so much of yourself that you do not realize that these little attentions are required of you. God would not have you burden others while you neglect to see and do the things that someone must do. It does not detract from the dignity of a gospel minister to bring in wood and water when needed. To exercise by doing necessary work in the family where he is entertained. Some of our ministers do not have an amount of physical exercise proportionate to the taxation of the mind. As a the result, they are suffering from debility. There's no good reason why the health of ministers who have to perform only the ordinary duties devolving upon the minister should fail. Their minds are not constantly burdened with perplexing cares and heavy responsibilities in regard to the important institutions among us. Again, Ellen White don't neglect little attentions. Don't neglect little courtesies. And don't neglect exercise. If we're getting so much studying done, spending hours on end studying, we're going to tax our mind. It's going to overtax the brain. So Ellen White said, be sure to have a proportionate amount of physical exercise to go along with studying. Very important to maintain that balance. And Ellen White said, the health of ministers fails because they don't maintain that balance. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 so emphasized this. Don't you know, know ye not, that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul, just like Ellen White, shared the importance of being temperate, being balanced, maintaining discipline in a number of aspects of life. The little courtesies at home, helping out, Study and physical exercise. All are important. All must be maintained. Three.
310 and 311 of Testimonies, Volume 3. Now Ellen White spoke to Dudley and Lucretia Canwright. All the faculties have a bearing upon one another. All need to be exercised in order to be properly developed. Brother and Sister A, it's to Canwright, Neither of you enjoy physical domestic labor. Both of you need to cultivate a love for the practical duties of life. This education is necessary for your health, will increase your youth usefulness. You think too much of what you eat. You should not touch those things which will give a poor quality of blood. So again, the balance, the balance. Study, practical home duties, exercise maintaining that balance very important very important page 312 you were inclined to offset your deficiencies by magnifying and dwelling upon the wrongs you suppose exist in brother and sister white and had you an opportunity, as those did in Battle Creek, you would venture to go to greater lengths than did some of them in their wicked crusade against us. So Dudley and Lucretia Canwright joined up with the people in Battle Creek to make the whites' life there miserable. Folk, if you study out the history of Ellen and James White when they moved to Battle Creek, they didn't stay there that long because the brethren drove them away. Drove them away. Now, that letter where Ellen White tried to appeal to Dudley Canwright to be balanced in his life with everything Dudley Canwright never forgot it. She, she was Dudley Canwright's bullseye for the rest of her life. For the rest of her life. Now, last week we mentioned briefly about this gentleman who wrote a history, a book, about his experiences with Dudley Canwright. The man's name was D.W. Revis, or Drury W. Revis. The book that Drury Revis wrote was called I Remember. If you can get a copy of that book, folks, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, Revis, we found out last week, worked in the Ohio Conference. He was a student at Battle Creek. D.M. Canwright had asked Reeves to come to help promote the Sabbath school work in Ohio. Uh, in Ohio, he came to be a close confidant of Canwright. The reason those details are important is, is because Drury Revis makes some very provocative statements about his relationship with D.M. Canwright. Drury Reyes felt very good about Elder Canwright. He said, I felt highly honored by being selected by Elder Canwright to do special Sabbath school work in Ohio. This appointment proved to be the beginning of a very close mutual friendly association. Elder Canwright talked freely with me about everything in which he was interested, his personal difficulties his past trials and sorrows, his future hopes and plans. He seemed to find consolation in going over these things with me. 
So Drury Revis and D.M. Canwright developed a close relationship, had a close relationship. Reeves goes on. His estrangement began and developed through harboring the greatest seductive thing that finds its way into human hearts, an abnormal desire to be great, to be popular. Canwright was remarkably bright, grew rapidly from his humble beginning through the blessing of God. And the power of the message he proclaimed with heaven bestowed ability. He was greatly admired and praised by our workers and the laity. That he finally reached the conclusion that he had inherent ability. That the message he was proclaiming was a hindrance to him. Rather than the exclusive source of his power. He became sensitive and resentful. And when reproof came through the testimonies, he rejected it and finally gave up everything and began warring against the spirit of prophecy and the message which had made him all he was. Now, if you remember, in 1880, Dudley Canwright became um, his... Voice was giving way, and Dudley Canwright decided that he needed to go to a school of elocution where he would learn how to speak properly. And so he went to Chicago in 1880 uh, at Ham Hamill School of Elocution. And the way that they would practice what they were learning at the school was Hamill would have these men, most of them were ministers, he would have them go out and speak to some of the large churches in Chicago. And so in 1880, Canwright went to a large Baptist church in Chicago And there were 3,000 people in attendance. And after the meeting was over, people flocked around Dudley Canwright and said, oh, that was the most wonderful sermon we'd ever heard, and you're such a wonderful speaker. Well, later on, after the meeting, Drury Revis and Dudley Canwright sat in a park near the church and Canwright said so Drury tell me what I could improve on was my tone good was my appeal good was my voice how did it come across well Revis said Elder Canwright the sermon was beautiful I, I got lost in the message well DM Canwright then jumped to his feet Canwright sprang to his feet and he said, D.W., I believe I could become a great man were it not for our unpopular message. So tragically, D.M. Canwright, the seed had been sown in his mind that the reason that the, what was holding him back from becoming great was the Advent message. Dury Revis, shocked at the beginning, he got up, he stepped in front of D.M. Canwright, and he said with much feeling, Dudley Marvin, D.M., the message made you all you are. And the day you leave it, you will retrace your steps back to where it found you. Oh, friend, how tragic. How tragic. Because that's exactly what happened. Dudley Canwright did leave it. You know, many years later, that was in 1880, 23.
Three years later, after Canwright had left Adventism, he had left the message. 1903, in Battle Creek, Drury Revis met D.M. Canwright again. And we read this statement from this book, I remember. It says, I prevailed upon him to attend a general meeting of our workers in Battle Creek, 1903, with the view of meeting many of the old workers. He was delighted with the reception given him, pleased with the cordiality of the new workers. All through the meetings he would laugh with his eyes full of tears. The poor man seemed to exist simultaneously in two distinct parts uncontrollable joy and relentless grief. Finally, when he came to the review and herald office, where I was then working to bid me goodbye before returning to his home in Grand Rapids, Michigan, we went back in a dark storeroom alone to have a talk. We spent a long time there in this last personal heart-to-heart -heart visit. I reminded him of what I had told him years before in Chicago, and he admitted that what I had predicted had come to pass. He wished the past could be blotted out, and that he was back in our work just as he was at the beginning, before any ruinous thoughts of himself had entered his heart. Friends, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. I tried to get him to say to the workers there assembled what he had said to me, assuring him that they would be glad to forgive and take him back in full confidence. I never heard anyone weep and moan in such deep contrition as did that once leading light in our message. It was heartbreaking to hear him. He said he wished he could come back to the fold as I suggested. But after long, heartbreaking moans and weeping, he said, I would be glad to come back, but I can't. It's too late. I am forever gone. Gone. As he wept on my shoulder, he thanked me for all I had tried to do to save him from that sad hour. He said, D.W., whatever you do, don't ever fight the message. Wow. Wow. In 1903, Dudley Canwright, was pleaded with by D.W. Rebus, a man who highly respected him and said, Dudley, D.M., turn around. Come back to the message. And Dudley Canwright said, it's too late. It's too late. You know, folks, as we saw last week, there is a distinct parallel with Dudley Canwright and where the Seventh-day Adventist denomination is today. Dudley Canwright left the Adventist messages, threw them away, the sanctuary, the spirit of prophecy, the three angels' messages, state of the dead, threw them away, righteousness of Christ, he threw them away. And folk, there's going to come a point. There's going to come a point in the history of Seventh-day Adventism when the denomination will have gone too far. And I believe, friend, that will come. That will come at the time of the National Sunday Law. And folk personally, personally, 
We've got to make sure our heart is right with the Lord on a daily basis. Because, folk, if we're tampering and playing around with wrong, there will come a time when wrong will be so emblazed on our hearts that we will say with Dudley Canwright, it's too late. It's too late. This is such a solemn, such a solemn moment in this man's life. I can't come back. I would like to. But I can't. It's too late. I am forever gone. Well, before we close, there was one other vision that Ellen White had prior to Dudley Canwright leaving the Advent message. She said one night she had a dream and she saw a phantom ship that was out in the sea. Now a phantom is a ghost. Synonyms of a phantom are apparition, ghost, spirit, specter, shadow, a figment of the imagination. Well, Ellen White said she saw a phantom ship and she applied it to Dudley Canwright. And she wrote to him and she said this, Dear Brother M, and she's referring to Canwright, I had an impressive dream last night. I thought you were on a strong vessel sailing on very rough waters. Sometimes the waves beat over the top and you were drenched with water. You said, I shall get off. This vessel is going down. See, Dudley Canwright saw the Advent messages. And Dudley Canwright said, they're going to die. They're going to be plunged under the water and be forever buried at the bottom of the ocean. And so Dudley Canwright said, I'm getting out of here. This vessel is going down. No, said one who appeared to be the captain. This vessel sails into the harbor. Praise the Lord, folks. The Advent messages... Doesn't matter how many things are thrown at the messages of Seventh-day Adventists. Folk, they're going into the harbor. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. They're going into the harbor. This vessel sails into the harbor. She will never go down. But you answered... I shall be washed overboard as I am neither captain or mate. Who cares? I shall take my chances on that vessel you see yonder. The captain said, I shall not let you go there. I know that vessel will strike the rocks before she reaches the harbor. You straightened yourself up and said with great positiveness, this vessel will become a wreck. I can see it just as plain as can be. The captain looked upon you with piercing eye and said firmly, I shall not permit you to lose your life by taking that boat. The timbers of her framework are worm-eaten. She is a deceptive craft. If you had more knowledge, you could discern between the spurious and the genuine, the holy, and that appointed to utter ruin. Folk, there are still two great ships out there today. There are the three angels' messages 
And that is the ship that is being guided by the Lord Jesus Christ. And those messages, folk, are going to arrive safe in the harbor. Every other ship, every other one, that turns away from those three angels flying in the midst of heaven in Revelation 14, that exposes Rome, that exposes rebellion, that exposes apostate Protestantism, that emphasizes the power of Christ to save, that talks of the judgment in the sanctuary in the sky. Friend, those messages will end up safe in the harbor. Safe in the harbor. Ellen White, this is recorded in Fifth Testimonies 570 and 571. I awoke, she said. It is this dream that leads me to write to you. I was feeling deeply over some of these things when a letter came saying that you were under great temptation and trial. What is it, Brother M? Is Satan tempting you again? Is God permitting you to be brought to the same place where you have failed before? Will you now let unbelief take possession of your soul? Will you fail every time as did the children of Israel? God help you to resist the devil, to come forth stronger from every trial of your faith. Be careful how you move. Make straight paths for your feet. Close the door to unbelief. Make God your strength. If perplexed, hold still. Make no move in the dark. I am deeply concerned for your soul. This may be the last trial that God will grant you. Advance not one step in the downward road to perdition. Wait, God will help you. Be patient, the clear light will appear. If you yield to impressions, you will lose your soul, and the soul is of great value with God. I have been writing upon the first volume of great controversy, and it makes me feel very solemn as I review these important subjects. Ellen White longed to see Dudley Canwright in a saving, committed relationship with the Lord Jesus. Longed to see it. Never happened. It's too late. I am forever gone. Dudley Canwright spent the last 32 years of his life attacking the spirit of prophecy and the great truths of Adventism. The woman he hated so much he declared to be a noble Christian woman at her funeral. Dudley Canwright will one day rise at the end of the thousand years. He had everything in his hands and he let it slip through his fingers. Wow. And we will close this study on Dudley Canwright with a very famous and most appropriate saying by John Greenleaf Whittier. For all sad words of tongue or pen the saddest are these. It might have been. Friends, I am thankful today. Dudley Canwright closed the door to his probation. And he could truly say, it's too late. I am thankful today that it's not yet too late for any one of us 
and that God is calling us today to renew our commitment and our dependence upon Him. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you today that you wanted to save Dudley Canwright so desperately that you poured out all of heaven's gifts in his behalf. Father in heaven, thank you that you are doing the same for us today. Father, save us. Save us from ourselves. Help us to depend upon you, to be in submission to your authority in every way that only Christ, only Christ would be formed within our hearts and in our minds, the hope of glory. In his name we pray. Amen.